Hi. I'm Greg D, and this is Dylan B. And we're okay. coming at you live from Craft Chocolate we're TV. We're not. We're cutting that. We're cutting that. We are definitely cutting that. What's up, everybody? Hi. I am Dylan. I'm Greg D'Alessandro. And we're coming at you live from Craft Chocolate TV, and we are going to talk about all things Craft Chocolate today. And we've got a really good episode for you because the last episode we did, we had a lot of comments and questions, and we're going to try and answer them. And Without further ado, let's talk about <laughs> I'm gonna our favorite origin, like someone asked for. We're, we're going to put that second. Okay. So I, I really want us to talk about the things that can potentially go wrong on a day-to-day -day basis because uh -oh. that's been my last, say, three or four uh -oh. days. Oh. And so we're going to start on like a heavier note that's yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. funny now yeah, because we've it. had a bunch of wine. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and the short answer of what can go wrong is literally everything. Yeah, and this is something that's really underestimated in any type of manufacturing, especially yeah. small-scale manufacturing. Yeah. You think, I'm just going to make chocolate, and then you find that your water lines clog, <laughs> which is what happened yesterday, mm -hmm. and you try and call a plumber, and it's like, you know what, it's easier to just fix it myself, but it yeah. takes most of your day. And like, so today, yep. we had the handle break off of a bucket, and you know, 20, 30 kilos of chocolate spilled, no, it was about 20 all over the floor and you have to spend a lot of time cleaning, which is another thing that we don't normally talk about that much is the amount of time we must clean. Well, well, cleaning and, and honestly, like waste that happens, right? Because like things, you know, um, accidents happen, you know, uh, um, contamination happens. Um, we have in our factory at Valencia Street, we have all like these, the, um, the shelves above the melangers because for some reason we thought a great idea was to store things above an open thing. It was and a like, good idea when you didn't know yeah. actually. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, and like now, like we're much better about it, but like at one point it was like, you know, like someone dropped a, a case of chocolate in there and you're like, oh, there goes 30 <laughs> kilos of chocolate that we can't use. Yes. Um, okay, I, so how many times have you guys had a chocolate spill or oh. lost a grinder or ball mill? Oh God. Left a valve open? I mean, I, like literally uncountable times. Oh, that's sad. Well, no, because it's just we like... We still count. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it's it, not, not because like our... The, the team that makes chocolate down the line does an amazing job, but like at some point it's statistics. So like um, I used to work at Google and I thought one of the things that, that I thought was really interesting there is when you would talk about the number of servers, the number of like literal computers that worked in their data centers, there is a statistical model that you just say, well, like X number of them are going to die every single day because like as you get bigger and bigger, it's just like things go wrong. And I think this is one of the things that I think is really important is you just have to don't don't feel bad about it. Like, make sure you're determining what process you have. So like, and I think this is one of the things that happens is like, the very first time something goes wrong, you're like, okay, we're changing everything. So this never happens again. But like, you can't it's never have possible. a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. There will always be something breaking. And so I work with an engineer. Yeah. He's amazing. He's actually the reason that everything continues to function because at the scale we're at, we now have enough equipment with PLCs mm -hmm. and intelligent programming that there's always something breaking. And so if you don't have somebody who's able to fix that, you are in a lot of trouble. Well, I, I would also say like one of the things we started doing is you can, you do the math of, you can do preventative maintenance, which takes time and energy. Right. There's, or a, you can there's like, an expression, an ounce of cure is worth a pound. No, wait, wait, a, wait a second. Mm -hmm. That's a good expression. You, you That's one of my about? favorite expressions. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, no, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Is that an expression? That is an expression. My favorite expression. Unless you now. just made it up. Yeah, I might have made it. But that's what I was going for. But no, it's true. It's and, very and so, much like, so. And, well, because the because at least when you're doing preventative maintenance, you have an understanding of when when you're going to be able to do it. When something goes down, it goes down in the middle of the holidays. <laughs> you're scrambling, right? Yeah. And it's like it's better to Usually know. It's Christmas. Yeah, exactly. It's always Christmas. Um, and it's better to know when something's gonna, when you're gonna do the work instead of like having to do it unexpectedly. And so you get to a certain size, yeah, you have to start doing preventative maintenance. You gotta start realizing that like things are definitely going to break. It's not a question of if, it's a question so, of when. So this is something that most craft chocolate makers underestimate. And it's the amount of time that you have to spend not only cleaning, but fixing things. 
And it's, we really are starting on a down note. Like I feel yeah, like no, the last we're one, going, we're we had up. so much it's break from stuff, here. And here we're like, oh, <laughs> shit breaks all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Things break all the time. I did not swear. It was just the week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the week yeah. that I went through. I, uh, another thing that happened in the last five I days. Like this is like this is like therapy, and I appreciate it. <laughs> You're a good thing, good person to bounce this off of. <laughs> we we made about four thousand chocolate bars for a private label customer. Oh, yeah. We should talk about private labeling. That's actually FedEx, really interesting. That'd be a great one yeah, to talk yeah, about. Good FedEx left it outside no. in the Kona sun, which Kona is on the big island. It's a lava field desert. And after 24 hours in the Kona sun, in the lava field, it bloomed naturally. That's what chocolate would do. Yeah. And so we are in a position where we are larger than the customer that we sent it Two yep. and who hired us to make it, and so we're absorbing most of the expense of remaking it. We can only hope that they continue to reorder, but this is just something that happens. Yeah, so yeah, we, we've spent true. now the last few days unpackaging 4,000 chocolate mm -hmm. bars, remelting, grinding it back up, and then we're going to remold them. And what, what I think it's November yeah. 17th today, maybe sure. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah, it's yeah, November, it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> a little off. But anyway, yeah. so this, this is just stuff that happens, yeah. and we're now really busy and understaffed because we just are coming out of a coronavirus well, summer. And, and it's, it's interesting to this because I think this is one of the things that we, we, we definitely struggle with, which is, at some point, it's not unexpected that bad things are happening. You need to just expect them. You need to expect yes, things are going to go wrong. that's exactly what I'm trying to, to yeah. point out, is we must just accept that it's going to happen yep. with a good attitude. Yeah. And just to, to, to tackle it and not beat yourself up over it, yeah. and not get upset with anybody yeah. else over it, to just know that we got to move on. So, so, so um, this week, uh, in, 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 in stories of what's happened this week, <laughs> um, one of the things that happened this week um, for us is we use a third-party warehouse. Um, they, they have cold storage and they have frozen storage um, in San Francisco. If anyone is in San Francisco and wants to use them, it's called United Cold Storage. They do a great job in general. Um, but <laughs> but like when you're storing like hundreds of pallets with somebody, it's the same thing as we were talking about like server farms or foreign servers that are going to die. You store hundreds of pallets, some are going to go missing. And so, but the problem is it's inevitably that like pallet you really need that you're like, hey, like we need that pallet of Madagascar chips back. And they're like, what pallet of Madagascar chips? You're like, but the one you really definitely have. <laughs> um, and like, but, and, yeah, and, exactly. but like, you know, so this week they lost two pallets and it's not because they're incompetent. It's because they yeah. deal with a lot of volume yeah, yeah, we, and you yeah. just have to assume it's going to happen sometimes. So we keep our beans. A lot of our beans are stored in at East Bay Logistics. Oh, so for EBL. anybody on the mainland, we store at EBL. East Bay Logistics. We store our beans at United Cold Storage because we like to freeze our beans to suppress moth activity. We should talk about moth activity later. We're so fun. Oh, there's Everyone so much to talk about, about. Everyone loves on moth, about moth activity moth. because we deal with it way more than Oof. most people because Oof. we're in the tropics still. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just... But anyway, at East Bay Logistics. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes you want it to get picked up, but the wrong truck picks it up and it goes to the East Coast instead oh, of Hawaii. No! When you really need it. And you find out like five days later when you go to check in on it. Yeah. So this is just stuff that happens and you got to accept it. But, but it's true. And, and I think like part of what, um, so, you know, I talk to a lot of new chocolate makers. Um, if there are new chocolate makers out there, I'm happy to talk to you. I, I'm Careful. not. No, I know. But no, but it's true. I really am. Like, I mean, that's His number is, that, but it's, it's why we wrote a book is because like, we, like, we feel like, Oh, great book, by the way, the, Dandelion Chocolate Book. I'm going to pitch this one is. He, he, Greg first told me about his book a couple of years ago, and I was like, "And you thought I was crazy? What are you doing writing a book? Yeah. Right now, there's so much to do, and I'm so impressed with the craft chocolate book, how to make chocolate. You guys did such a phenomenal job, including all of the the studies that you had performed. And one of my favorites was the cocoa, the the, the stone melanger." The uh, yeah. ball particle mill. size. Oh my God! Oh, look, look at, at that. that, Carson, coming through. Now it just seems like we're shilling, but we're not really <laughs> shilling. <laughs> this book is so good for anybody who wants to start making chocolate. You must get it. How do you get I'm, I'm this? I'm blushing. This is not wine. This is blush. <laughs> um, uh, it's on Amazon. It's um, so good. It's but, a must buy for anybody who's interested in making chocolate because you'll learn everything you could want to know initially. 
I, but but in, in fairness, like, the reason we wrote it was because when we got started, there was no book, right? We started in 2010. We started at the same time. And when we got started, there was no book. There was, there was nothing you could go and well, read. Well, this is why we like, TV show. Yeah, exa exactly. And I, I, frankly, you're probably going to have more people watching this than reading our book. But whatever. Um, uh, no, but I, I think it's... Um, I, I think we're a better industry if there's more people in the industry and the people in the industry who are making chocolate are making better chocolate. Because like, I, I, I think some people feel like it's altruism and it's, I'm not saying altruism is bad, but I, I'm, I'm a very, I'm a pragmatist at, at heart. I'm a pragmatist. And I feel like if, if you can, if you can make sure that people making chocolate are making better chocolate, all of craft chocolate benefits from that. Because if someone's making terrible chocolate, and someone buys it and eats it, and they're like, "Oh, craft chocolate! I get it. It's gross. That so, hurts the whole industry." And hit, so, like, I'm all for this. Is why we have been so open here in Hawaii yeah. to share what we have learned. Some people listen, some people don't. That's up to them. But we want to see the bars and the shelves. If they're going to be eight to ten dollars a chocolate bar, we really want it to be good because if someone buys a nine dollar chocolate bar and it tastes bad yeah. they're less likely to buy another nine dollar yeah. chocolate yeah, yeah, bar right. totally it hurts us right well it hurts it hurts the industry and and i'm not trying to say that like we're perfect when we make perfect chocolate all the time like i think i think we i would say we make polarizing chocolate so we make bars with sort of like intense flavors and sometimes people don't love those flavors and sometimes people do um but um but i think there's kind of a difference between something that like is sort of made well versus something that like you like or don't like, you know? So there's the sort of like hedonics of like, do I like this or not? Versus the sort of like quality spectrum, like under refined is considered like, you know, it's just it, it, like, I mean, I guess some people might like under refined chocolate, but like, yeah. so there's, well, there's, that's what's so nice about the United States is there's no regulations on yeah. what you can call it chocolate, except for something like 11% cocoa yeah. must be in it cocoa, cacao, right? Um, so other than that, it can be rough, it can yeah. be stone ground, it can be gritty, it doesn't matter. I do think, uh, I think it's just like, uh, just like one last important point that I think it's really important for everybody in the industry to support each other. Because, um, and you know, and when I say the industry, I'm not That's just talking about chocolate makers, I'm talking about cacao producers, right? Like, we're all in an industry together, and I think um, yeah, if, it's a niche within a niche. Yeah, totally. And, but I think if we think of it as competitors, if we think of it as like somebody else succeeds and that means mm -hmm. I lose, we're all going to lose because we're, we're a tiny industry. Well, I also you know? don't think anyone who truly buys into that model will last. Because yeah. that's what and that's what happened in craft beer. Exactly. In craft beer, all that's the people who really wanted to sort of like go it on their own didn't last very long. Yeah, craft beer is an excellent model for craft chocolate because craft beer had so much room. I mean, yeah. shoot, Ben Organ, mm -hmm. I think there's a craft brewery for every thousand people. Oh, yeah. I don't even know how that's possible, but they seem to be doing Drink well. Drink a lot of beer, that's how it's... Yeah, we need to get people to eat as much yeah. chocolate as yeah. Yeah. beer. <laughs> if only people eat that much chocolate. <laughs> eat more chocolate, people. Okay, we're probably talking to the okay. wrong okay. crowd on that. Yes. But we want to talk about two different models. There's a cafe model where, oh, yeah. when I say that, I mean retailing. Right. And then there's the wholesale model. Yeah. And so there's also the online model. Actually, the online that's, model is that's kind of a new model now. New, yeah, yeah. yeah. And but we're gonna tie that. But into, it's real now. We're gonna tie that into retailing, just because you it's got. hard to online uh, increase yeah. your online sales without a retail presence. Yeah, that's Very right. Strong that's retail right. presence. Right. And so the two models that I'm gonna throw out there right now until we divert is Dandelion, since that's where we are come mostly from. retail. And then Dick Taylor. Oh yeah. Who's mostly, mostly wholesale. wholesale. And yeah. both are successful models in their own way. Um, Dick Taylor has a small retail. I, I can literally hear Adam like laughing and laughing and laughing as we say it's a successful model right now. Uh, Just probably, <laughs> but they're they're moving a lot more cacao than we are right now. Oh. So No, I, and, and they're doing all right. Dick Taylor makes great chocolate. Honestly, some of my favorite chocolate and, out there. And the, and the other reason I chose those two is because you guys both do two ingredient chocolate. Yeah. The, well, actually, I think they've started they've started branching out more than Re we have. recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Recently. And they do inclusions and things like that too. They're what we would call smart. <laughs> yes. Okay. We're gonna ignore that. <laughs> oh, sorry. Go on. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna ignore that part and just focus on the cafe concepts, retail yeah. versus wholesale. Yeah. 
You, you, just for the record, cafe retail seemed like like genius until you know a pandemic hits. Yes, exactly. We're gonna ignore the pandemic for the very like next just couple really, minutes, can we? Can and we? we're we're so gonna then we're gonna branch the into how that really backfired in it, an unpredictable I mean, way. I don't know that it backfired. I think it just like it was a big shift. Our retail disappeared. Our our retail. You our still retail, had retail? Yeah. Throughout the pandemic. I mean, I mean, it like literally we have like a for anyone who's been to our shop like we have we usually have a shop you come in and what we have now is like a, um, a counter and a window that people can come up and buy things but like people still want to get out of their house and like San Francisco I think has been very. How much did your retail your revenues drop? Oh, like eighty percent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm not saying. It Ours was well. probably more like ninety five. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So. Retail disappeared for the most part during the pandemic. Yeah. But it's the only way Manoa Chocolate was able to grow yeah. and yeah. thrive for about eight years. Same, same with Amline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was really, really helpful and also had unintended benefits in the sense that we were able to have face to face relationships with our customers who then became ambassadors in a lot of that, ways. That is. In my opinion, by far the best part of having retail establishments is you can talk directly to your customers. Somebody else isn't representing your brand, you're representing your brand, and so like you choose how you want to do it. Um, that's one it, facet of it. The next sure. is that you have money right away. Yeah, 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 yeah that's true. So when you sell at retail, say, $10, yeah. you then have money to pay people and buy beans. I mean, that's true, but it's less predictable. It's again, we, we get into statistical modeling Correct. as opposed to like, if you sell a pallet of chocolate, you get the money for the pallet of chocolate you sold. If you're selling retail, you're like, well, here's how many bars we think we're gonna sell today, right? And yeah. so like- However, did you notice it became predictable? Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah very much too. Totally. We're, like, yeah, yeah. we're like, okay, we're gonna do X yeah. number of thousands of dollars it's, this month, and we were within like a couple thousand dollars. I, I mean, I, st I studied engineering, um, because I don't know if anyone's noticed this. I'm a little bit of a geek, um, and uh, and I love numbers and I love statistics and like one of the things that I think is fascinating and like it's interesting because I mean we still have these conversations all the time at Dandelion where people are like, how can we possibly know what's going to happen next year? And the answer is there's no way to know what's going to happen next year, but you can make a model and then adjust that model as things are happening and then get closer and closer to reality. Well, and, and this is like, a whole other conversation yeah. because by making models and predicting the future and writing it down, it's so much more likely to happen. Oh, totally, because you have like a goal to shoot for, you know if you're, if you're succeeding or failing according to whatever goal you've set, yeah. you know? So this is a, a little bit of a tangent, but I was shocked mm. when I looked at the three-year projections of Manoa Chocolate before mm. I started. Oh. And then like four years later, I went yeah. back and I found this document and looked at the numbers and it didn't follow it year to year, yeah, of course. but by three years, it was almost exactly what I had written down. And, and this it, was, is, it just blew my mind. Um, we, and we were talking about this in the last episode, and I think this is one of the things that like, one of the nice parts about the, the more you grow, the more you have multiple sort of like channels or you know revenue streams. So like at Dandelion we have, yeah. um, so there's Dandelion Chocolate Japan. So we have um, we have wholesaling cafes in Japan. We have wholesale um, accounts. We have um, our online store. We have our chocolate experiences team where they're um, they're doing sort of classes and things. We have our retail offerings. And what happens is that the nice thing is the more of the, that those sort of different models you have. You can be off on one, but you're not going to be off on all of them. That's and so, right. like, Chocolate Experiences has been doing really well, even though, like, the Ferry Building had to close down because so of, like... you outperformed in some places, yeah. you underperformed in others. And, and the and more... numbers still panned out. Yeah, it's coming out... You um, like that pun? That was a good one. I like that. Um, we, uh, well, uh, uh, it was about two weeks ago, um, our projections from the beginning of June to now, we were off by something like 0.02%. <laughs> No, I mean, it was a, like a ludicrously yeah, small, um, well, but, but again, it's because there's, there's, we're doing enough different things that like you can be off on here, but then go up on there and you, you also adjust it over time. But um, I would say that like for, for new businesses starting, it is really important to just have like, 
like a like a goal, a picture, an idea of what you're heading for, because then you then you know how to measure yourself, and it also gets you into the discipline and the mindset of like of of measuring these things, because that's the hardest part, I think, is the measurement. Yeah, and you guys do a good job of that. You're always looking at your numbers, and most people don't do that. We do a pretty good job of that. So, so what I've noticed is in any type of craftsmanship, people want to just make something. Yeah, that's fair. And I remember talking to a guy before I had really begin begun and had an overhead and had yeah. employees, and the guy goes, you know. One of the best pieces of advice I can really give you is find a numbers person. Yeah. Find a person oh, who totally. really does enjoy data and look at numbers. I love spreadsheets more than anything in the world. That's not true. I love Coco, but I love <laughs> spreadsheets a lot. And you put them together. But that allows you to see the future. It allows you to, to see what's actually going on in your business in a way right. that you couldn't otherwise grasp. Yeah, yeah. And so that was such good advice. Yeah, yeah, no, it's totally true. That I, I didn't understand at the time. I do now. I've, I like looking at the financial, in fact, I love looking at the financial statements, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's become it's really, really enjoyable. <laughs> this is a little side note as well. It's the only class I've ever failed <laughs> is accounting. Well, but I didn't have anything to apply it to. That's exactly. I feel exactly the same way. Like, like trying to do something in the abstract versus doing something with sort of like an application that like makes sense to you. It's very challenging. Um, and like, I, I, um, I, I find the challenge of, of sort of running a business, of figuring out how to make something work, fascinating. Like, I think it's really like, yeah. it's really interesting. But I, I would also say, and what you, what you just said, I agree with, which is, I think people get into people get into anything for a variety of different reasons. People get into craft chocolate for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes people love chocolate. Sometimes people love packaging. Sometimes people love cocoa. Well, this you we, know. we were talking about this before. Yeah. You found people who actually just like to sit there and package chocolate bars. Heck yeah, right? Well, and but but like people starting businesses. I think one of the things, and you mentioned this earlier, one of the things that's important is like it's still a business. So even if it's even if you love making chocolate, like it's still a business, it's still manufacturing. We've had people contact us that say, "I really want to make chocolate, but I don't really like dealing with equipment. What do I do?" And the answer is, don't make chocolate. It's still manufacturing, right? And as much as like we enjoy the output and like and you know, it's there's there's certainly an artistic element to it. It's still manufacturing, and you still have to there's deal two, with equipment. Two things. And the first thing is that. You, like, <laughs> there's certain things you can't avoid, obviously. Yeah, yeah. And that at the end of the day, I'm just it, it, it is a business. And so you ah. have to make enough money to do it again. So that's so important to wrap your head around. I love that you, definition of like, you got to make enough money to do it again. Right, because it goes, huh. it ties into what you're actually wanting to do. Yeah. So if you don't make enough money, to buy more cacao beans or pay right. the people to yeah. make the chocolate, you can't continue to do it. And so there's this is a dual, this right. is the two things that I was talking about, is you can, you can sacrifice profits only if you're retailing and wholesaling at a price that it actually is not, uh, like, like let's say that it costs you $5 to make a chocolate bar. And if you're wholesaling for four fifty, you're losing money. Right. However, if you can increase your volumes mm -hmm. by wholesaling, you can then in, uh, it, drop it, your price. It, it, if you're able to reduce your costs. Of course, but that's the game. Yeah. And so if you can retail enough, it actually works out to the point where you can sacrifice on the wholesale side yeah. in order to increase your business if you have a strong enough retail presence. And, I mean, and that's really what Manoa Chocolate but, did. That's the strategy I took because we went from $6 to make a chocolate bar yeah. we were selling for four fifty to $5 wholesale. Right. Right. And that didn't work in a conventional model of most people being like, what the heck are you doing? However, as you increase your volumes, you buy more cacao, yeah. you drop your prices of shipping and price per kilo. Yeah. You in our case, cocoa butter. Mm -hmm. The cocoa butter price comes down, the sugar price comes down. Everything starts to get better when you hit volume. And so that's really what I'm trying to say here. Because if you're trying to make 
you know, um, eight bags of cacao a year. Yeah. It's really expensive to make a chocolate bar. Well, I mean, I, I still feel like part of it get, just gets back to, what's your business model? Um, like, if you're going to try to build a chocolate company, everyone needs to sort of figure out, like, what's their specific model. And I know... Um, but there's, I, there's certain models that don't work. If you're below a certain amount of chocolate bars, it, you're just going to struggle and fade away. I, yeah. I strongly believe... No, that. I mean, I, I, I agree with that. But, but I, and, I, and like, there is a number. There's... But, but as you said, like, Dick Taylor is a great example of a company that, like, the vast majority of what they do is is wholesale and I, I mean from all like at all per, from all out external sort of you know um perspectives it seems like they're doing a good job um and they have a good and healthy business um but i would also say like one of the things that's sort of um useful and interesting to understand and we run into this all the time is that like i would say don't believe the hype um hype of what the fun well, hype what, when I say when I say don't believe the hype, I, I, what I mean is that like it's easy to see a company that has like, you know, so like Dandelion, right? We have we are making a wide variety of single origin chocolate You're bars, like seventy five employees, and, and everyone assumes like, oh, these guys are making tons and tons of money, when the reality is like that's, you know, I, I think we are still trying to we are still trying to get to a point where we're profitable. We are not profitable. We haven't ever been profitable. Right, but like I we're think we're exactly the opposite. Where we right. didn't ever have the opportunity to not be profitable. But 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 I would say like it's easy from the outside in to look at a company. And I'm just saying this because we're talking about Dick Taylor. Yeah, and it's no, easy to say like really oh, everything's doing great with Dick Taylor, listen. right? But like you don't know, you know. And like I mean, I think they're smart guys. Um, I, I, and and they make a good product. And I think that they've figured out how to make a model where it's sort of like they have a good balance of like the amount of the, the like how to make chocolate in a way at a scale that can can end up sort of making a sustainable business that's really 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 hard and I think I, I would also say for anyone who's like really working hard initially well but until but, you hit the scale sure and but have the increase to but I would say for anyone who's just starting now it's like it's like you gotta go for a while before you get to that point because it's 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 easy to feel like you're never gonna get there. Right. Yeah. It's in, in, in part because like it is hard to get there. And, and like and that's why I'm saying like Dan Line, we haven't gotten there yet. We're not profitable. No, you know? no, not in the way you approached it. So I guess it's yeah, more it's... of um, and this is exactly what we're talking about. The cafe versus wholesale model. Mm. But if you approach it, what was by, that what we were talking about <laughs> originally? Oh, OK. It, when we hit four or five tons is when we started to be like, OK, we are actually profitable enough that this is a business yeah and enough. we at that point retailed 90 percent oh wow that's why it was profitable hmm. so we had two stone grinders yeah that were doing about 20 25 mm -hmm. kilos mm -hmm. every three or four days running non-stop yeah and that meant that we were profitable enough that we could survive on a on a okay income it, it, like, good. and this is in hawaii this is yeah yeah this is not super successful at two grinders running full full speed, I mean, never stop. One of the things that I think is interesting between Manoa and Danline is like we're both in places. So Danline's in San Francisco and Tokyo. Um, we're both in places where uh, y you know it, the cost of living is high, and so you have to pay your employees you know a, a fair amount of money, um, and so. I understand why people don't do manufacturing in San Francisco for the most part, but I also think like part of the reason we are in San Francisco is because we, like, I, I, I mean, I shouldn't speak for everyone on the chocolate making team, but I think a lot of people appreciate that there's a diversity of jobs, right? That you can have a job that's chocolate making and that's not like an office job or you know or or um, or or something else that you know yeah, are sort of and, and some San of common Francisco jobs. in general is a weird bubble where people will appreciate the single origin aspect of what you guys yeah. are doing well, whereas but, we weren't able to to survive on single origins alone but but so this is a really interesting point because like you have to use your assets and one of your assets is you have a constant or had but like we'll come back a constant stream of tourists we gotta ignore it right for the most part. no but like but like i think one of the things that's really important is like everybody has a different set of assets and so like in san francisco we absolutely had one of our assets is 
I mean, there's a couple of them, but one of them is definitely like we have a market it's a sophisticated where sophisticated palette. We exactly. also have there's enough people in San Francisco who make enough money who can buy chocolate from us, right? At at like in in like one of the things we try to do is we have at, a distribution of prices at a price that but, I'd consider an affordable luxury. I mean, for San Francisco certainly, for I, you know, um, I mean I like. I, I definitely am, I try to stay cognizant of like what does affordable really mean and it's one of the things that we really struggle with is like what's the right price for our bars. Um, a number of people who work at Dandelion now work at Dandelion because they, they, they bought one of our bars even though it was a little pricey but it wasn't like so pricey that they couldn't afford it. They loved what we were doing and they wanted to work for us. And like I think if we end up like moving our price point too high we get to a point where like our own employees are like, oh, I mean, I like what we're making, but I would never ever buy it, right? And so like, I think we want to try to find that balance. And, and again, like, I'm not saying we've done it perfectly, um, but I think what, we're, what that's one of the balances we're trying to hit is that like, if our price point ends up sort of like moving too far and our own it, employees feel like, yeah, I'd, know, I'd it, never buy it that. It really doesn't need to move up higher if we hit a certain scale. Mm. So you can still make really good chocolate or the chocolate that you want to so, make. So nine dollars is a standard bar for us and I think that's a that's an appropriate price for a chocolate bar. Yeah and that's I, okay. I like, and so let's let's dive into that. Let's do the distribution wholesale retail model. Yeah sure sure. So I'm gonna throw out some basic numbers. If we're going to sell at three dollars a chocolate bar to a distributor, yeah. they are then going to mark it up Let's and and for, any, for anyone who, who hasn't done this before, and I know, I'm, I apologize if this is all old hat, but like the way it normally works is a retail price, wholesale price is about half the retail price. Some people do like half plus shipping, but like you can consider a wholesale price, and this is information I didn't know when we started doing this. Yeah. Wholesale price is half the retail price. Um, if you work with a distributor, the distributor is now selling the wholesale price. So let's say for a nine dollar chocolate bar, if your wholesale price is four fifty, the, the the distributor says, "Well, if we're going to sell it at four fifty, we need a little margin." And so it's you percent, right? Exactly, and it's usually twenty to thirty percent, somewhere yeah. in that range, right? So what the distributor says is, "You're going to sell it to us." At thirty percent off of the four fifty, and so thirty percent off of four fifty is math, math, math. Um, yeah, exactly. Somewhere in the three something thirty range, I believe it is. Um, right, and so, um, and so that that is your distributor pricing. Now, I think one of the things that happens is a lot of people say, I mean, why don't I just sell it myself? I'd rather sell it for four fifty. Yeah. So this is a really good point. No, no, and this happens all the time. Yeah. It's people are like I like. And, and a priority is a priori is the biggest distributor of craft chocolate in the United States. I think they do a phenomenal job. I think, like I think they really they, have they really do, and they understand our market in a way that no one else has grasped yet. Totally, and and they've grown the craft chocolate market. Now, yep. I guarantee there's someone watching this right now and be like, oh, but they're taking thirty percent. And the answer is, you're right, they're taking thirty percent, but they're doing work for that thirty percent. Yeah, it's a and job. Like, it's a job, and so like as much as so we don't work with any distributors. Everything we sell is either direct retail or wholesale. We don't work with distributors, but if you don't work with a distributor, it means you're you, hiring people. Yeah, exactly. You have to pay somebody to talk to your wholesale customers. You have to like ship out all the packages on your own. You have to have your finance team go and talk to people to make sure that they're right. paying like right. the bills. And so the distributor is doing a lot of so work we that sell you don't have to do. Five thousand bars at one time, and don't worry about it after that. And that just there's sounds like a lovely, lovely there's thing. Something sometimes beautiful to me. about that. Yeah, and I, I know that they're going to do a good job. Well, right. Um, but here's the downside of the distributor. Again, love you, Apari. Downside of the distributor, um, when we sell direct to all of our customers... You keep the 30%? No, it's not just that. We know them. Yeah. Right? So there's a more, so, okay, so it's more of the retail, like, face-to-face. -face. That's exactly. Hey, how you doing? Like, what bar's your favorite? Right. Right. And so, like, there's, there's an aspect of not going through a distributor means you have, a, like, a, like a closer connection. Now, sometimes that close connection is a good thing, and sometimes it's a bad thing, right? Because it also means something goes wrong. You sell a pallet of bars to a distributor, and like it's gone. If that pallet, it's like they can't move that pallet of bars if they're not able to sell it to anyone. That's not your problem. Right. That's their problem. If we can't move chocolate, that's our problem. 
right? Or, worst case scenario, they're storing that pallet of chocolate somewhere and it gets lost, it gets destroyed, etc. Again, their problem, not your problem. All of those things become our problem. And so, like, it, it, like, I think one of the things we were talking about statistical models earlier, but like one of the things to think about all the time is like, there, um, I early on in my career, I had like, um, I had somebody who sort of explained risk versus issues in a way that I really appreciated, which is like, a risk is an issue that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> which, right? But, but like, okay. but, so that doesn't mean a risk is, a risk is something you ignore. Risk is something you mitigate, right? You can't live your life without risk. Walking down the street, driving a car is a risk. Building a business Starting is a risk. Factory. Starting a chocolate factory is absolutely a risk. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh my God. No, I'm, I'm fine. Um, uh, <laughs> starting a chocolate factory is a risk. So there's a lot of things that we do that are risks. And what you, what you need to do is mitigate those risks. And so like, to some degree, working with a distributor is mitigating the risk of not being able to sell chocolate because you know you're gonna sell it. Okay, so this is a perfect segue into- Oh, is it? I'm blending. so glad I did that. Oh, those are your glasses. Blending. Oh, break those. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, know oh, that you actually look pretty good in my glasses. I have to admit, like, I guess. Do you really need glasses? Okay, it's just for looks. I don't even notice a difference, so maybe I need glasses. All right. So, blending for risk. Yeah. That's what Manoa did by right. starting to wholesale and distribute mm -hmm. and retail. Mm -hmm. And so it stabilized us totally. in a way that right that now- That is one way to mitigate risk. We're actually is, okay. Totally. And that's a really good way to do it. We also private label, which is really helpful and that's primarily what has right. gotten through this time, this last six months but of it's, uncomfortableness. I'm, I'm not going to mention who they are because, I mean, I'm sure they'd be fine with it, but like there's a chocolate company who at one point something like 80% of their sales were to Whole Foods, right? That's a problem. Well, it's a problem because, again, what you've now done is you've introduced a risk that something happens with Whole Foods, so they change their mind, Perfect something goes wrong. We, half of our wholesale yeah. was duty-free stores in Hawaii. Great, this is a great example. They were a beast. They ordered so You're like, this chocolate. is amazing. They're taking all of our chocolate. Yes. At the same time, I knew it was a problem yeah. because they were too dominant. Yeah. And we relied on them too much yeah. to the yep. point where I was like, okay, well, let's try and diversify this yeah. because yeah. it's now a risk. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and like when you say diversify, like it, you don't have to be a huge company to diversify. Even as a small no. company, I think diversification of where you're selling your chocolate is important to do so that you're not too reliant on, well, and this is something that actually is, we do, it's probably on your list somewhere, but it's something we do with cocoa producers. We try never to be the only person buying cocoa from someone. Yeah, because then you feel bad if you stop buying and they well, die. It's, it's not just, it's, it's not feel, feel bad, it's like we, we become a risk point, right? And so like, yeah. Um, Costco has this model where they won't, if they become more than 25% of your business, they I they didn't cut know you that. Off. That's a great model. Well, after That's they, smart. After they killed so many businesses oh, yeah, by not buying again. Yeah. And then the whole business is like, something. this is all we have. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So it's the same concept that we've applied here and right. why we're still okay. Um, yet in Hawaii, even the tourists were the ones buying from wholesale accounts sure. for us. Yeah. Well, and I, I mean, you could make an argument that we were too heavy on the retail front. Now, granted, we had retail distributed across the United States and, and Japan. Nonetheless, we were pretty heavy on the on the retail front. So, to some degree, when the pandemic hit and our retail went down significantly and our online went up significantly, to some degree, there's a little bit of luck. What was your percentage of growth on online over the, the last few months? I. I I don't remember the num number off the top of my head, but it's somewhere in the neighborhood of like four to five hundred percent. Okay, we ten x Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't... I, I wish I had the number off, off the top of my head, but I don't. But it, it definitely, like... Uh, we also put a lot of effort into it. Yeah, we did too. Yeah, we, we very quickly sort of, s s like, shifted into, like, oh, we need to, like, online needs to be core competency for us and not just something that we do on the side. And so we, um, and like, including like literally like, you know, there's a lot of people in the company who are now working on our website, working on like online offerings. We've upped our game in taking photographs and, you know, all the kinds of things that you need to do to, to, to ensure sort of an online offering is successful. Um, 
Yeah, moving into the future, I think every craft chocolate maker or most businesses that are especially small must have a strong online presence. Oh, I think I think it's also the best. I think the pandemic overhead. Yeah, and I think the so, pandemic has permanently caused a shift to online where people are going to like. And I don't think it's going away, right? You know, like I I think that there's one fear that like if the pandemic ends, what's going to happen is. Like, I know the pandemic's not going to end. Pandemic end. Ends. Yeah, okay, fine. Okay, we're. Come but, on, let's be optimistic. Okay. You said when we first started. When? You were an op optimist. No, I said I'm a pragmatist. I am not an optimist. That's I'm true. a pragmatist. That's right. You did say Are pragmatist. Are you kidding me? I'm I, an optimist. Oh, no, I'm not. I, no, I, I like. You're not an optimist? No, I, I, I like more than anything, I really am a pragmatist. Like, um, but, but I would argue. Okay, you're pragmatic. Okay, okay. Sure. I'm going to be really honest here. I'm I'm, I'm I'm what I'm what what is often described as a smiling nihilist, which is, which is, but like I, I I think fundamentally the reason I'm a pragmatist is because I think like the future is what you make of it, but like you should make it great, right? And well, you know, have a, a part in shaping it. Yeah, exactly. Well, and and like I think that I think the fact that the future is unknown doesn't mean you have no control over it. This gets back to, to sort of the conversation about like statistical modeling, right? Like just because you don't know precisely what's going to happen doesn't mean you have no idea. It just means like you got to build a model and your model is going to be less precise. Um, I, there's an old joke that we yeah. used to tell back in the engineering days. This is going to be a great joke. You guys are going to love it, which is like so, um, someone made, made so, someone uh, I was talking to was talking about how like, you know, a, a model of the universe would be basically be the size of the universe. And I was like, no, a model of the universe is X. I mean, it's a poor model of the universe, right? And, but like, this is like, just because you don't know exactly what's going to happen doesn't mean you can't model it. And your models get better and better and better over time, right? And so like, you can still model things. It's just that like, you have to accept that like, yep, there's a bunch of things I don't know. And so yeah. there's a bunch of things that aren't going to go exactly the way I ex expect them externalities. to. Externalities. Yeah. Exter well, externalities and internalities, right? Both. And so, like, you sure. just ha you just have to you just have to accept that. That, that like, ties back into the, how our conversation started. <laughs> externalities true. and internalities. That's true. It's fair point. Yeah. And you just know that they're going to happen. You don't know what they are, but they're going to happen. Well, and as long as you account for that, as long as you know that. Like everything doesn't right. go it's well what, all the time. What no one accounts for in their a business model. No, I mean your business model. I was like, I was like I didn't smart account people account for in a business model. Experienced people would account okay, for. Okay, experienced people. Yeah, you're, 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 yeah, yeah. I didn't account. Well, for it. but I would also argue it's it. Uh, uh, not to not to get too deep in the conversation, but like it's also an aspect of of, of the privilege of being able to choose your business and your business model. I, I, like, and part of the reason I say this is because yeah, yeah. a lot of the cocoa producers we work with, right? There's a lot of people who are producing cocoa today, not because they have chosen this as exactly what they want to do, but because this is sure. this is a model that works, um, or it's a model that works well enough. And like, I think it's or lovely in a position where they don't really have a choice. Yeah, and so I think it's it's I think. I feel very grateful that we have the flexibility to choose what we want to do, but I think it's also important to not like extrapolate that to everybody in the world has that privilege, right? And so like, and this is one of the things that I think is important in, in sort of understanding chocolate making as an industry is that like it, there's a lot of different people involved in the industry and some of the people in the industry are in the industry because this is, th this is the best this is the best possible outcome for them, but even with that, it's not necessarily a great outcome. And so I would say, as a person in the industry, because I've actively chosen to be here, it's partly my responsibility to ensure that, the, that like, we're all in it together, right? We're an industry together. Yeah. Without cocoa producers, there is no chocolate. Well, and this is where craft chocolate does tie into that a lot more than the rest of the industry. And it's, it's sad that we're such a small part of it, but yeah. it's obviously growing. Yeah, and oh, that's totally. one reason we do this this show in the first place. So let's let's try and um, tie in some of what we have written down here to what do we have written down? The minimum scale to wholesale. When oh. did you start to wholesale at Danny Line Shop? Because I know you didn't. Oh, we we wholesale really really early on. Okay. Wholesale. Well, because wholesale wholesale is the easiest way to get started because you don't need to build a store. Building a store takes money. 
you can get you can get started with wholesale with like you know a website and a name and an incorporation certificate. So wholesale is like one of the we were doing like farmers markets and wholesale at the very beginning. Yeah. All right, so we tried to wholesale. My original plan was to wholesale, and no one wanted it. What? I, I couldn't get Whole Foods. I didn't get Foodland. I didn't get Down to Earth. I didn't like. How no. dare you? They're now great. How customers. dare you? But it was very challenging. No one yeah. wanted our product at first. Yeah. And Why was that? Why do you think that was? Because no one had ever heard of us, and craft chocolate was so new. Why would someone want to pay nine dollars for a chocolate bar? So, so you think it was the price point? You, you think it was like when you were offering the product you were offering at the price point you were offering didn't make sense to people? Is that what it was? That was the majority of it, but it was also, will this company be around in eight months? Oh, uh, and so people didn't want to like bet on the new guy. That's right. Oh, uh, interesting. Like interesting. I was 24. Yeah. I'd just gotten out of college. Right. And was trying to start a chocolate factory out of uh, 600 square feet yeah. with small grinders, like those yeah, little yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. And it and was a terrible model. Don't ever like no one should ever start with those oh those are way better i mean i'm not getting into the like you know i had to walk uphill both ways to go to school but um <laughs> in, uh, the snow. in the snow um uh yeah no we're not gonna get into it but but it's interesting you say that because like i i do think like part of the success of dandelion is we had people willing to bet on us early yeah. Right? You were in um, the right spot for it. Well, we're in the right spot. However, but, but everything... I'm grateful. I'm grateful that they still bet on us. They didn't need to. Buy right. So, buy right market, which is like. I met those guys. They're nice. They're nice is an understatement. They're amazing. They do a they're great job. Smart. I think, and they bet on us super, super early on. And so, even when we went through this sort of. Uh, uh, the, I don't know what you'd call it, the dry period where we didn't have a lot of bars to wholesale because we weren't making enough chocolate to like fulfill all of our retail orders and so we couldn't wholesale it because wholesale is a lower at that point was a lower margin for us now it's a pretty good margin um and but we still sold the buy right because like buy right um and I, actually i would that that's not totally true buy right and um jack from chocolate covered um he was my first first jack, person to jack from like, chocolate he, covered jack and chocolate covered if no you are watching like, this and you have a chocolate company and you're wondering who's going to be the first person to resell my chocolate jack, jack from chocolate covered he literally was the first person to resell almost every chocolate brand i know yeah. like um, i was so now, excited. i was fortunate oh that he's, God, so he's like five blocks away from my house <laughs> he literally like i've been i've been going to his place for 15 years way before i was i was making chocolate i was going there and buying chocolate and and like the thing that I, I think is amazing about jack is he has just this like perfect balance of like he has a market that will like try new things and buy new things i also think like jack himself awesome personality but also he's somebody who like he doesn't he doesn't pick favorites, right? And so something new yeah, comes in. So, so, so the, the bar that, is this weird to say that you're making Will's Bar from Lidgate Farms? No. Okay, great. Um, Will's Bar from Lidgate Farms. I was just at Jack's place a month ago and he's like, hey, I just got this chocolate from Lidgate Farms. Like, again, it's not like he, I think he really genuinely is interested in like, here are different things that people are doing, here's new things people are doing, oh, and then he wants to introduce people to it. Jack has the most diverse array of chocolate in the world. Oh, that's great. He's got I, I love it to death. Bars. I, well, I mean, it's our, so we are so spoiled at Dandelion that we are able to go to chocolate covered every single time when, when, when to like. find something new. Well, but not just trying to find something new. We decide to buy beans from somebody. We go to Chocolate Covered, and he has five people making chocolate out of that origin. Oh, those and, <laughs> and we can taste all of them and see, yeah. like, what did this person do? What did this person do? What did this person do? And, like, I, I like, again, like, I, I, I know this when This is a great opportunity to talk about what you guys just did recently with your origin stories. Oh, yeah, origin stories are fun. This is, oh like, my, my favorite project. This was so cool, and that was a really fun conversation we had because you guys had incorporated us into the Costa Esmeraldas, or was it Tangis? Tangis? No, it's Costa Esmeraldas. Yeah. Right. So, Dandelion Chocolate took lots of different makers and sold packs of other craft chocolate makers who used the same origins, and you could see the diversity of the, the flavors in the different chocolate bars. So that was and, really fun. Well, and, I'm and, glad you guys did that. Well, but, but like, so first of all, I think it's super fun. Cynthia, who's our, who is our Dean of Beans, which is like, 
the greatest title ever. It, um, it and Cynthia has been with song. Dandelion longer than I've been with Dandelion. Um, and she is, um, and she had, she was the person, she was the person who had this idea. And I thought it was a great idea. Um, because, because like, again, this gets back to, if you want the industry to grow, you got to grow it. Especially for Dandelion, like at the size oh, we yeah. are. That's like, so well said, because that's literally what we're doing yeah. right now. Yeah, you have we're to. We're trying to grow the industry. Right. right. And that's how we can feel good about what we're doing. Well, I, and I, I mean, like, I think it gets into, like, it's a responsibility, right? Um, and, and so one of the things, so, so as Dylan said, we do origin stories. And with origin stories, um, it is the, the cocoa producer. And I, I think this is also, so the, um, I wish Cynthia were here to talk about it herself, but um, part of the general idea behind it is she would hear cocoa or chocolate makers talking about what these cocoa producers are doing. But she's like, it's, it's better to hear it directly from the people making the beans themselves. Um, I think one of the things we really try to do um, at Dandelion is like, we, we're not hiding who we're getting the beans from. We are very vocal about who we're getting the beans from, partially to give credit where credit is due, and partially because I think in being vocal about where we get the beans from, it hopefully helps build their business as well, right? right? And this you know. is something we've taken more and more from Dandelion's model is to just be so open. What's They're, the downside? Exactly, that's it. And so I've met other larger chocolate makers and they're so closed off. And they're like, oh, we've got this secret yeah. process of how we make chocolate. And at this point, no, I know how no to make chocolate. No one has ever made money in the chocolate industry because of their secret. That's right. Like I, I like, that, I, and I guarantee that, I've exactly, talked to chocolate. Perfectly I've talked, said. I've talked to chocolate makers who are convinced that they have like a secret way that they're doing something, and that's why people buy their chocolate. I don't know how to break it to you. That's not true. No one is <laughs> that was buying a good your way to break it to them. <laughs> no one is buying your chocolate because you have a secret. They're buying your chocolate because they like your packaging. They like your story. Yep. They like your flavors. There's a wide variety of reasons that people buy chocolates, but it's not because of secrets. Yes. So you know. let, let's let that sink in a little bit. Oh, yeah. Okay, we're going to let that sink in. And we're going to tie it back to... Wait, can I say one more thing on that topic? So um, there was actually a really interesting paper written um, recently, that was published recently, from, uh, from Penn State, um, um, published by Allison Brown, who she did this really fascinating study on packaging. So she used Dan Lyons packaging, Okay, I'm, it's going to sound like I'm talking about this because it's uh, egotistical and it is not true. But, I mean, maybe a little bit. Anyway, um, but so she used Dandelion packaging, Hershey's, like a, a bunch of different bars. Because she was, what she wanted to do, and she was doing, she was doing like um, focus groups. And what she was interested in understanding is like, why do people buy chocolate? Like, what are they attracted to? Because as chocolate makers, we think people are attracted to something. But it turns out, we don't know. That's right. right. We're so like, entrenched in the industry, absolutely. we're not aware of what the reason people purchase chocolate is. So, so she said, so Allison, somebody I've known for a long time, and she said there was this very awkward period because as people were going through all the packaging, they got the Dandelion's packaging, and on the back of every Dandelion bar, it says this is who it's sourced by. <laughs> I'm Greg, I'm the sorcerer, and so every bar says sourced <laughs> by Greg. Everybody was fascinated by this. So it didn't matter that it said, it didn't matter other bars said you Rainforest Alliance. It. That's exactly, yeah. well, and, and it got to a point where people were like, look, I don't know what Rainforest Alliance actually does. I don't know who Greg is. Um, I don't know who Greg is, but like all I know is that he cares enough to put his name on a bar of chocolate. Um, and like, and so I think it, that's exactly, when you say humanized it, I think there's something to be said for like, it, like it, instead of being this like big faceless company like we're human beings we're people we're not great at everything we try our best and like i think that actually really resonated with people in in this case study um if uh i'm trying to think where the best place to look for this study is but like if you search for allison brown like craft chocolate you know you, you'll find it but it was really really interesting to see that like people cared more about the fact that we mentioned that's, that's a really real person than organic certification, Rainforest Alliance, Oots, any of these things, because nobody actually knows what those things are. 
Well, and we're not exactly in the same price range as those anyway, so you can add 20% of onto your the price of your bar if you're fair trade and yeah. organic certified. But we're more than that anyway, right. because we're paying so much more for our raw materials and we're making it well, on a smaller scale. And just to be clear, we are paying more for our raw materials. The vast majority of the additional price from Danline's perspective is the amount that it costs us to pay the people making the chocolate. The raw materials cost more, no doubt, but that's not the driving factor for the price of our bars. The driving factor is the, the so cost let's, of... So let's back up a second. Commodity cacao, $2.30 a kilo? Somewhere there, Ralts. Yeah. Fair trade? Fair trade, I believe, is a $200 per kilo, or $200 per ton, which is a 20 cent per kilo. So, $2.40? Yeah, so 50, like $2.50. 50 50 50 cents a, I, okay, a kilo. and again, before anyone emails us and tells us that this is not exactly the, we had, didn't look up the market price right now. Yeah, it's pretty dang close. It's pretty close. Right, so commodity cacao, fair trade. We're so much beyond fair trade, it's not even worth mentioning. Well, so here's the tricky part it's about fair trade. It's just what people kind of understand. I, I would say fair trade is not a bad thing. No, the concept is very good. The concept is great. I think the problem that happens is things turn into, um, I, I, I mean, maybe this is unfair to say, but like, I worked at Google for a long time, and it was fascinating. How's that possible? You're only 32. <laughs> I am, I am done a lot of okay, my okay, time. Okay, go on, go on. Um, <laughs> no, um, and like, I was there when we went through this sort of arc of Google at one point was trying to do new and cool stuff. And then it shifted. They're not anymore. Well, I, I would say it shifted into protecting what they were doing. And this happens with, I think, a lot of companies where when you start, you're like, you know, you're like, I'm going to do something new. I'm going to do something original. And then as you grow, I think... One of the things that can happen naturally is that people start to worry about what they've built and the loss, right? You worry about like, but I have this whole thing, what's going to happen to it? And then you hold on too tight. And I think it's so, so important to be cognizant of not holding on too tight. Because the reality is this is all ephemeral, right? All this is going to go away at some point. But if you hold on to it too tight, well, and I think... That's, you're adding stoicism to it. You, you are such a stoic and I appreciate that. <laughs> That's true, I do have that. Which I think has helped me a lot it, when we have so many things um, in, in a business to fix constantly that you can't foresee. Right, well, and, and oh man, what was our this topic? Is, this is a different conversation. Yeah, I was like, I was like, I was like now we're talking philosophy. Um, but, yeah. um, but, but I do think, um, uh, we had a. We, oh, did you forget this time? Yeah, now, now I kind of yeah. forgot where I was going. So uh, I'll give you as much time as you need. <laughs> Fix. Uh, so Google, worrying about what you predict. Fair trade. I got mm. this. Um, I think one of the things that happens <laughs> is that, like, fair trade started with the best of intentions. As they grew, yeah. Yeah, you have trade. people who are making a lot of money, and people who have a system. That like their their income and their livelihood is dependent on a system, and now it's in their best interest for that system to continue. Well, and, okay. So you, to add another layer to this, you're also talking about something that's based in San Francisco, I think. I mean, uh, Fair Trade US. So there, there's a ver variety of so there's Fair Trade US, there's or Fair Trade USA. I Let's focus on the US and sure. that's where we are. You have a bunch of folks. We're in Hawaii. I'm sorry. We're At the moment, in, we're, in Hawaii. we're in Hawaii. But we're not in the US. A bunch of folks in San Francisco, it's a bubble of expensiveness. And truth. They're trying to help people in mm. Madagascar, Ecuador, Tanzania, um, Uganda. Mm. Who, who would you knows? say they're trying to help? Or would you say That's the intention I'd like to believe. Now now you can elaborate on it, but if you're Maybe going you're right. Maybe to the get intention paid, is to help. If you're getting paid a San Francisco wage. God, which I is wish like, we could. Can we dial a friend? I want to dial Simran into this call right now. Um, Simran from Cocoa. Phone, phone a friend? Yeah, I want to totally phone a friend. Oh, because, like, he just... would. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I hear what you're saying. Like, what you're saying is that, like, the intention was. The intention to help is people. really good. And I, I agree. I think the intention the is good. The flaws are in the, the way that it's established. And if it's based in San Francisco in a place that's so expensive to survive, 
it doesn't function very well if you're trying to help someone in Nicaragua. It, it's because not someone's making five dollars a day in Nicaragua and I, someone's making like five hundred dollars a day in San Francisco. I, I would still argue that like one of the things you'll notice at Dan Line is we never talk about what we're doing is helping cocoa farmers. Yes, this is a great point. Because like I think like I think if your goal is to quote unquote help someone it, it you you again you're you're establishing this power dynamic of like you are doing something for somebody else like we're not helping cocoa farmers for like fundamentally cocoa farmers are helping us because without cocoa producers chocolate wouldn't exist literally at all yes right exactly and, you and so you're paying more and we're on such a small scale at this moment right that we're not really helping of course not and like and like I'm not saying that we're so I I would I would argue. The thing we're trying to do is not continue to contribute to an unfair system. I would say we're trying our best not to hurt the system. Now, we are, um, I believe we are helping the system. We're at the beginning of helping the system. I think system. we're trying to. Yeah, I think we're, we're trying, trying to. to. Like our um, intention is very so, good and we're trying to help the so, system. So, my, so Justice, who is um, who's somebody... Um, oh yeah, let's, let's give that a plug. Yeah. Oh yeah, we're plugging. Um, Justice is doing a documentary on craft chocolate right now, and one of my favorite parts of what he's doing is every time someone talks about the impact that they're having with chocolate, he says, "Oh, so you mean the cocoa farmers you're working with aren't poor anymore?" <laughs> yes. The well answer said. is like, no. And and like now, I think it's I think it's important to, to it's important to highlight that like like change happens incrementally over time. And so, like, you can be you can be paying a better price for cocoa, and the people that you're paying that better price to still might need even more money. And we will get there, and we'll figure out how to make sure that we're paying even more fair money. Fair trade, right? And this is where I get back to fair trade: is that I think fair trade, what, what fair trade is trying to do is find the middle ground between what's the appropriate amount of money for people to get for whatever it is. In this case, let's say cocoa. What's the appropriate amount of money for people to get for cocoa versus what are large businesses willing to pay? Because yeah, yeah, it's a balance. Well, well, I mean, like the only reason the only reason it's a balance at a higher price in order to. But the only reason it's a balance is because fair trade wants to exist. If fair trade were like, dude, this is the right price, you know, three times the world market price is the right amount of money to pay for cocoa, and everyone said. I am not getting fair trade certified because there's no way. And fair trade's like, why do you need fair trade at that point? Because well, we're paying that anyway, right? And notice, very few chocolate makers, very few craft chocolate makers are fair trade certified. There's a reason for that. Yeah, we're we're direct trade generally. Or this is a great conversation as well. Brokers. Oh. At, at a small scale. Brokers. Brokers. Love, love me a broker. Brokers are wonderful, and they get a bad rep because I agree. they are a middleman. Well, but they're in the same way we talked about distribution earlier. They are playing a very important yeah, role totally. in order to get quality beans at a fair price all the way to wherever you're getting, whether that's Europe or the United States, Australia. I don't care. So, so here's here's the interesting part about brokers. When we talk about brokers, there's like a, a number of them that a, a lot of craft chocolate makers know. Uncommon Cacao, Meridian Cacao, um, uh, ca uh, Cacao Services um, is another Cacao one. Services, um, uh, uh, oh, 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 Cacao Latitudes. Um, so there's a number of them out there that I think are doing a great job. Now, here's the funny part is, the cocoa producers in general love working with the brokers because their attitude is like, I don't want to sell two bags of cocoa to this guy, right? right? Their attitude is like, Meridian Cacao, Buys it's, it's half a exactly ton, half a like container of cocoa, six ton. It's just like distribution, and like um, and so the cocoa producers in general that I've talked to seem pretty pro distributor. The chocolate makers that I've talked to seem pretty pro distributor. There's this interesting though. There's this interesting sort of like middle ground of consumers who are like distributors bad, and like I would just say. Like the, it's a real role. It's important it is, that it exists. It, it, it well, exists. and the, the world's a complex, complex place and a complex system. Um, one of the examples I always give is like, as much as I would truly, truly love to drive a container ship, I will never probably drive a container ship. 
can't do everything. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, I don't know if you know this, but you can actually, you can book passage on container ships. I know. Yeah, right? I've heard about it. It sounds really cool. It's anyway. interesting. I don't know if I want to do it. Though. I think the first, like, three days is amazing, and then the next, like, 120 days, you're like, why did I do this? <laughs> um, why did I sign up? But, it? yeah. But, um, but, like, so there's going to be people who are in your value chain, period. Right? So, I mean, I actually, actually you, 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 Dylan, are an exception because you buy pe co cocoa from people on Oahu that they can drive the cocoa over to you. But, like, in general, there's going to be somebody else in the middle of your value chain. And that doesn't mean what that person is doing is a bad job. Fundamentally, what it means is that person needs to get paid for the work that they're doing, but that money shouldn't come out of the pockets of the cocoa producer. That's right. This is where things always go wrong. Is if you say, well, the world market price is twenty three hundred dollars a ton. What did we say? Twenty four hundred. Anyway, twenty. Let's go. Twenty three hundred dollars. You know, it really so boils down to the consumer. Yeah. Even to me, when you looked at the amount of chocolate bars at Whole Foods, mm -hmm. like you kind of have a higher standard when you think of Whole Foods, and then you looked at the chocolate bars and you're like, oh wow, well, this is all Calibo private label. But but this gets back to. Well, sure, but you make private label for Lidgate Farms. That's right. That doesn't mean that when someone's buying a Lidgate Farms bar, they're not buying a unique product. That's right. However, every single bar on that shelf, out of the 15, probably 12 of them were Calibo. Yeah, but, but like Calibo makes Tony's Chocolate Only, but like Tony's Chocolate Only gets the specific beans they use, etc., etc. I'm just saying... And they're almost slave-free. <sighs> almost. <laughs> Oh, this is good. This is about to get really good. Hello, everybody. The Manoa team is about to join us. <gasps> Until next time. Is that, is that it? That's where we're wrapping that up.